What a privilege to be with you. Let us hear the reading of God's word from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The scriptures declare, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's now come to the throne of grace. Shall we turn again in God's word to Hebrews chapter 1? As I come to be with you again, I want to thank you for the privilege of preaching to you on this opportunity. You've been very gracious to let me be part of your fellowship from time to time, and it is deeply appreciated. When I come here, I still hear in my mind the preaching of S. Lewis Johnson. And I say, Lord, I'm not worthy to be in his pulpit. But God is gracious, so here I am. Here I am. Every once in a while, I listen to that Believer's Chapel hard drive with all those sermons, and I, I hear that voice of powerful exposition. I say, Lord, will a few crumbs from his table fall my way? So we are blessed. Dan Duncan has been a great, long, faithful preacher of the Word, and he's become a dear friend through the years as well. So, Dan, I don't know if you can hear me today, but thank you for sharing your pulpit with me. And so it's a great joy. George Whitfield Society makes this happen, and so my good friends from the Whitfield Society, thank you. Today, as we look at God's Word, which we've read and we've asked God to bring to our hearts, really touches in a question that has been asked through the ages. Who is this Jesus? Who is this person? We know that the question has been wrestled with. Uh, we remember in just a couple years, we're going to have the 1700th anniversary of the Nicene Creed. Perhaps you've memorized it, or at least you've read it along the way. It says that, speaking of Jesus, he's God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance with the Father. Classic theology. But not everybody would agree with that. In fact, we might ask generally, what do people say about Jesus? They would say, well... He was a founder of a worldwide religion, we'll say that much. Or they might even admit he was historical. There are some records, you know, he can't trust the Bible, but, you know, there's a lot of other evidence that he, there was a person named Jesus. Well, even Islam believes in him as a lesser prophet than Muhammad. And there are lots of liberals out there that want to call themselves Christians, and the, like the famous Albert Schweitzer. He said, of course, there was Jesus of Nazareth. He was a deluded first century apocalypticist, thinking the kingdom of God was going to come, and it didn't come. And by the way, someday they'll find his bones somewhere in some unmarked grave. No resurrection. That's the liberal view. For most, he's a great teacher at least. We can give that. And yet, C.S. Lewis has reminded us, you that's the one option you can't take about Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, Abraham saw my day. Abraham was a thousand years before Jesus, and he saw his day. That can't be possible. Uh, Jesus said, I'm coming back. He says, I and the Father are one. The only options that we can take, says Lewis, is that he's either a liar or he's a lunatic, he's crazy, or he's the Lord. He really is God. 
Now that should be self-evident, but we realize that there has been a wonderful movement of evangelical preaching in America. Uh, now it's ebbs and flows, but there's a whole group of people that will call themselves evangelicals. You, meaning good, angel, angel, good messengers. We believe in the good message of the gospel. And what is the good message? That Jesus died for my sins. And they say, isn't that wonderful? We have a Jesus that shed his blood so we can be saved. Those are evangelicals, according to the Barna Research Group issued by the Ligonier Study Center that R.C. Sproul started many years ago. And they discovered in their survey of those evangelicals that 45% at least did not believe that Jesus is God. They believe he's a great savior. He's done a great thing and God is used. But he's not God. We, we can't say that. So the question that we need to ask is, who is this Jesus? And what did he really do? And you know, that question that's still with us was being asked right from the beginning of the Christian message. In fact, it's why the book of Hebrews was written. There were a group of people who were Hebrew Christians. They had come to faith in Jesus. And before the temple was destroyed by Titus in A.D. 70, there was this glorious temple. All of these sacrifices where pilgrimages would come from all over the world to honor the great legacy of Moses and the Torah and the religion of Israel. And there was this ragtag group of people saying, well, we believe in Jesus. And they said, he's dead, and you claim he's alive. He is, you can't follow him. And it was costly. These were Jewish people in the shadow of the great temple, in a community that had a legacy going back millennia. And they said, you're foolish to believe in Jesus. And so they were marginalized. They were rejected. They were thrown out of the synagogue. They're beginning to feel persecution where people said, we use it today, we're going to cancel them. Don't do business, they're Christians. That was a reality. And so the question began to be asked, is it really worth it to follow Jesus? Is it really worth putting up with all the hostility, all the opposition, all the ridicule, all the difficulty, all the persecution, all the hurt and pain it creates in families when you're divided over religion? That was a real question. By the way, it's still a real question today. In fact, some of you may have come today and said, is it really worth following Jesus? This world doesn't like Christianity anymore. There might have been a time when joining a church really gave you a little advantage in your career. Today, it's a negative mark on your ability to get ahead. In fact, more and more they're saying you're part of a hate group. You teach what the Bible says? you got to cozy up a little bit more with the progressive direction because that's where the world is going. And you got to go along to get along in this world. Is Jesus really worth it? Have you ever asked that? It was asked back then. And so this great expositional epistle, and we don't know who wrote it. There's been lots of speculation, but we won't try to solve that one today. But whoever wrote it clearly was from heaven because it's far beyond any human being to have written this brilliant piece of literature. It's extraordinary, and I can't demonstrate all of that here. But let me just say this. It was a practical exposition growing out of the only Bible that Jesus ever used called the Old Testament to show that Jesus is worth it. Today we want to understand why Jesus is worth it. And as we look at these first opening verses, we're going to see that Christ is worth it, first of all, because of his extraordinary place in history. Secondly, we're going to see that Jesus is worth it because of his relationship with God. And then thirdly, we're going to see that Jesus is worth it 
because of all that he does in salvation and other aspects of his ministry. Now, as we begin to look at this question of Jesus is worth it, I want you to have in your mind a sub-argument that is absolutely critical in answering that question. And that is, you cannot separate the work of Christ from the person of Christ. Remember, we've heard the evangelicals, 45%. Oh, I, Jesus is my Savior. He is not God. We're going to argue and we're going to see that this text requires that we declare that Jesus is all that he is is God, and that is why what he does as Savior is possible. We cannot separate his person from his work. Let's begin by looking at that first person, our first point about our person of Christ. Christ is worth it because of his relationship to God in history. Notice how it begins in verse 1 of this first chapter of Hebrews. Long ago, at many times, and many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The first thing that we see here is that there is an affirmation that God has spoken in history. God has revealed himself. And he's writing to a Jewish audience who have followed Christ, and they recognize the prophets are the climax of the Torah. The whole Bible is God speaking. He's saying, don't we believe that God has spoken? Yes, he's spoken in different times and in different manners, different ways. We could spend a great deal of time to talk about what are the different times that God's... It was by degrees. It was little by little. We call it progressive revelation. Some obvious facts. There are 39 different books in the Old Testament. Isaiah 1.1 will mention four different kings under which Isaiah gave his prophecies. We discover the Psalms, 150 distinct compositions by various authors. From Moses to Malachi, there's a thousand years, and we don't know how long God had spoken going back to Adam before that. There were different ways that God spoke through praise and history, prediction, a song. As Hebrews 11.13 will say in our very book, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Saying, yes, God has promised things. We know that, right? That's our starting point. We have the Old Testament. That's not the problem. These people who follow Christ say, I think we're just going to go back and be Jews. Is Jesus really worth it? We, he's establishing we have a common base. And not only at different times, but in different manners God spoke. This says, long ago, going back in the history of Revelation, at many times and in many ways. What were some of the ways God spoke? God spoke to Adam in Eden. God spoke to Moses in the theophany of the burning bush in Exodus. We read in Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, that God works through dreams and visions. It says in Numbers 12, verse 6 and 7, And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Moses was extraordinary in having a face-to-face, -face, if you will, dialogue with God. But Jacob and Joseph and Daniel, they had dreams and visions. We know that angels brought God's message. We know once God spoke at a voice at Sinai, once he wrote with his own finger on stone his very commandments. Typically, the prophets were inspired, and even Balaam discovered that God can use a talking donkey. It gives every preacher encouragement every Sunday. I want you to know that. <laughs> we understand that he uses types and rites and ordinances and exact ceremonies. God spoke. He spoke to the fathers through the prophets. This is what he says. But now this is critical. He says, if we've established that God has spoken in all of this long period, in all of these different ways, listen to this, but 
In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. He is saying you need to understand that the climax of all that God has ever done, little by little, by degrees, progressively, has reached its crescendo, its climax, its ultimate goal. And that is, he speaks and has spoken in, the text literally says, in son. Doesn't even have the article. Everywhere else when you study in the New Testament, it talks about, it's used in the son, but here it's son. And it seems that it's almost as if he's saying he spoke in a sun-wise kind of way. It is the son. But what does it mean to be a son? In fact, you might even say that's his name. So when you say, well, he is the Moses, you don't say that. You say he is Moses. Or he is the Abraham. We don't call him he is the son because he is son We'll read later, that's the name he's inherited. It's a name above the angels. No one else has been named son by God, and God has given him that his name. So the contrast, first of all, as we understand this passage as fellow Christians in the Hebrew tradition, Christ is worth it because all of Revelation reaches its ultimate sense in him. And so... We should see, when we read the Bible, like Spurgeon says, it doesn't matter what hamlet you're in, what little road you follow, it will lead you to London. He said, so it is every passage you look at in Scripture, if you know what you're doing, it will take you to the sun. The sun. This is the climax. He is worth it, first of all, because all of the history of God's speech leads us to this one. There's no one else like this. He is the climax. We could say so much more about that, but we don't stop here. We stop here and realize that God has a purpose for him in the sense that he is his heir. Notice the next verse here. It says, in these last days, the climax of all of history has come to Christ. He's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. In other words, all that's happened in history, everything that's unfolding in redemption is bringing him to be the rightful recipient of it all. Now, this word heir of all things is an interesting comparison with what's said about Abraham in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. Do you remember it says, and Abraham was appointed to be the heir of all the earth? That's great, but this one's even greater than that. He's the heir of everything, the entire universe. Now, so we stop when we hear the language of heir, we start thinking of royalty. When you are a royal person and you come of age, you get an inheritance, you get a title. You become, what is it, the Duke of Wales? Or you become the King of England? Or the Queen Consort of some sort of country? You inherit a title. It becomes yours. And so there's an interesting moment in church history. Forgive a church historian. We need a little church history every once in a while. You may remember Anthony, who's the desert monk. They went out into the desert, and the monks would come, and they'd live separately, and every once they'd get a lot together. The emperor had become a Christian, and he was taken by the piety of some of the monks. And so the emperor wrote a letter to Anthony, And he was to share it with the monks. And imagine you're in the middle of the desert. No one knows where you are. And the emperor of the universe, as you know it, has written a letter to you. And as he prepares to read it, he says, My brother monks, do not marvel that an emperor would write to you. Marvel that God has written to you. Some of you would be really excited, maybe not if Joe Biden wrote to you, but maybe it was George Bush. He was a Texan. You might say, I got a letter from the president. Do you realize God has spoken? He's spoken his word that leads us to the son, who's the heir of everything, and he's written to you. And his letter just kind of collects dust on your desk, on your bookshelf. Could we do better? 
He is worth it because of his relationship to revelatory history. He is worth it because of the point that history brings him to be the heir of the entire universe far greater than Abraham. But notice he's worth it because history's beginning is with him. As we look again at our text, it says, In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, which is the ultimate climax of all of history as he receives it all, through whom also he created the world. He was the one that began history. There would be no world here if he did not do it. Do you remember John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on to say there is nothing that's been created that was not created through this Word. He is the creator of everything. Every little piece of sand you're going to touch on your vacation this year at the beach is here because of King Jesus. The sunset that you're going to enjoy while you're boating on some beautiful lake somewhere. Maybe there aren't too many lakes in Texas, but you'll find one. Jesus created that. He's the creator of everything. Christ, is he really worth it? Is he really worth following? Well, let me ask you, is there anybody else that you know of where God said everything I've ever said ultimately is about him? Have you met any other person in the world where you say the whole world is aiming until he receives the crown rights of being king of kings and lord of lords over everything and he will make all things new? Do you know anybody else like that? Is he really worth it? Are you willing to recognize that a physicist doesn't even know what really is going on until he recognizes that there is a big banger behind the big bang? And his name is Jesus. He is the sovereign God of the universe who spoke it all into existence. Is there anybody else who are you going to give your faith up for? Because someone's making you uncomfortable? Because someone claims to have multiple degrees and you don't? Because he has more money than you or he has more power than you? Before God, he's nothing. The greatest opposition that you will face is no one compared to to this one, Christ is worth it because of his total domination of all things historical, whether it's revelation, whether it's the climax of where history's going as the air, or where it began at ground zero when God said, let there be light. He is it. You know, he could have stopped his epistle right here, I think, but he keeps going. He says, okay, Christ is worth it because of his absolute rule over all of history. The second point he will bring to us, Christ is worth it because of his relationship with God. Now, I'm going to have to turn you into some theologians now. Are you ready? Got to wake up. Should we get up and do 10 jumping jacks real quick right now? Get the blood circulating? Okay. I told you we could stop right here, but my sermon, I'm sorry, doesn't stop. I've got more. So I've got to keep you awake for a little bit. You need to think carefully. And I'm going to introduce a passage that I'm going to call the bad conscience of the Arians. Now, you may not understand the word Arian, but it goes back to a man named Arius, who was the great opponent of Athanasius. Maybe you've heard Athanasius. Athanasius was the great defender of the doctrine of the triune God in the ancient church. He was exiled multiple times defending the scriptures. Arius was close to the emperor. And Arius said, you know, this Jesus is great, but there's a time when he was not. He was created. He's the first of God's creation. He's not God. He's kind of an expression of what God wanted to do in the world. He's not God of God, very God of very God, begotten of the Father, not made. No, he was made, and he is a lesser God than God. He is a dawn compared to the bright sun of the universe. He's not God. So the bad conscience of the Arians, I hate to say it, is essentially become the 
theology of almost half of the evangelicals in America. He's not God. He's my Savior. Now, wait a second. We haven't gotten to the cross yet. We're talking about the Son. And what we're learning is the Son is the centerpiece of all of history. But we don't stop with history. We're now going into eternity before history. We're going into the very nature of who God is. Notice what it says here. This verse that's never quoted by any Arian theologian is the bedrock in a few words that establishes the absolute deity of God. And here are two persons. It's not the full trinity, but it gets us started. Notice as we look more carefully. He's the heir of all things through whom he created the world. Verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Those, I think there are 16 words in English there. There are 10 in Greek. And every one of them come together to establish an extraordinary truth. And I want you to really think carefully with me. First of all, notice the he is referring to to the Son. This next thing you see is the present tense verb is. In the original, it's an ongoing reality, a participle. It's the word being. If any of you have studied a little philosophy, you came across the word ontology. That first part of that word ontology is the word that's used here. It means being, the study of what is. You say, wow, that's really abstract. Well, philosophers are abstract. But this is what he's saying. Being right now, because this is who he is. By the way, that's what God is. He's always in the present tense. I am that I am. God is. He doesn't have a past, a future. He's not even in the present. In one sense, he's outside of time. Time exists within him. He is true reality. The Son right now is being the not A, the radiance. Okay, now because Dr. Johnson was not afraid to say Greek words in the pulpit. I would not do this anywhere else except at Believer's Chapel. It's apogausma. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? Okay, apo means from, like apogee. You've heard that if you follow the astronauts or satellites. Away. The next part, auga. Have you ever heard anybody nicknamed Augie? That's a Greek word for dawn. Anybody here named dawn today? It's the rising of the sun in the morning. You're saying, man, my baby's like the rising of the sun. What a beautiful name that is if you think about it. dawn. The rising from the dawn. And the ma at the end. In Greek I learned years ago, the suffixes are on many nouns are either cis or ma. Okay, The ma here is saying... This is a very reality of importance, okay? It's saying, from the shining of the dawn, the shining of the dawn. When that sun first comes up over the horizon, and suddenly it's, all of its rays come beaming, and you, and you turn your eyes and say, where's my sunglasses? That's the word that's used here. It's saying, the sun right now is the specific rising of the glorious sunshine of the glory of God. You cannot separate God's glory from this glorious shining of who the sun is. So I'd ask you a question. When you see the sun's rays, do you see the sun? You're seeing the sun. This is the sun entering it. It's inseparable. The rays of the sun are the sun. It's the sun reaching us. And that's the point. The Son, S-O-N, is as one with the Father as the Son, S-U-N, is with its rays. That is its, his ontology, his being. He is very God of very God. We don't call that moonshine out there. Now, I know that has a different meaning south of the Mason-Dixon line, but <laughs> we're, we're talking about astronomical terms here. Okay? He's saying basically this is the glory of God. That's the sun. He's all that God is in his light. God is light. He's the rays of this light. Now, just secondly, he goes on from establishing, if you will, in his being, he's absolutely inseparable from the Father. 
But then he goes on to say, he is the radiance of the glory of God. Remember the glory of God, the pillar of cloud and fire, the glory that came down upon the temple, the dwelling cloud we call the Shekinah glory. He is that. He is the glory of God in history. But it doesn't stop there. It says, now you got that end. You you have not completed who he is in his relationship. He is also the exact imprint of his nature. Now, this is a fabulous place to learn a little Greek. And by the way, you know the Greek word here. You ever talked about that person as a lousy character? Or say, man, a man of character or a woman of character. That's the Greek word, character. The word originally means a stamp that you put like into wax. When you pull up the stamp, the wax becomes the exact imprint of what was on the stamp. If we have any industrialists here, it's tool and dyes. Remember when it comes down and it makes the impression, it leaves away, it's exactly an exact copy of what hit it. I'm from Philadelphia and we have the Philadelphia Mint. And you get some coins with a P on it. When you go and tour the mint, they tell you that the coins that they stamp out have the force of a 60 car freight train hitting that piece of metal. And when it comes out, it has an image that will never leave it until it wears away. It's an exact duplicate of what that stamp does. An exact, but we know that penny is not the stamp. Now, I'm in Texas. This word in the Septuagint is used in Leviticus of a scar that a burn leaves. And so I'm thinking of a Texas cowboy. He gets his branding iron, he gets it really hot. And what does he do? He starts cooking that piece of beef that's going to be cooked more later. And then when he pulls it off, there's an exact duplicate of what the branding iron is. That's the same image. An exact cop. That means he is not the Father. He's distinct from the Father. But wait a second. He's one with the Father like the rays of the sun are one with the sun. And yet he's distinct from him, but exactly like him. Are you beginning to get the idea? This is one God who subsists in two persons now. But we don't stop there. Notice, now this is where you really got to get your theological hat on. Get ready now. As you look at this word, verse 3, He is right now the beautiful rays of the sun that are precisely the glory of God, like the dawn and the sun rays, they're one and the same. He is the exact imprint. He is, if you will, the one who's been marked by all that God is, but He's not God the Father. He's the Son. And how is He an exact mark? What is He? Well, here's the word that's used of his nature. Now, the word that's used here is actually a word you know too, even though you don't know it. And I'm going to try to explain it to you. So, have you ever heard the Greek word hupo? That means under, like a hypodermic. This is the word hypostatic, or hypostasios. It's a word that theologians use for person. But it really, if you take it clearly, if you translate it into Latin, and you already know the word, so don't be afraid. Under, submarine, sub is under, hypo, sub. Second part is stantia, under, standing, because the second part of stasia is the word in Greek, istemi, to stand. So it's substantia, substance. Something that stands under something. And, well, then you put it right into English. If it's hupo istemi, substantia, it is understanding. Do you ever use the word understanding? I use it almost every day, don't you? Now, the word understanding, that it's translated here, is a very rich word. It's filled with meanings. So I'm going to summarize a few of them. One of the meanings, if you study in the Septuagint, actually is used for the word garrison. What? How do you get that? Do you know what a garrison is? It is a fortress filled with soldiers. 
Why in the world would this? Because if you're understanding something, it means you're in a place of absolute surety, security. A fortress with soldiers is a place where you're absolutely secure. They're going to protect you and no one can harm you. You have a fortress and you have power. That's, that's used that way. Sometimes it's used in one of the Psalms. Is, have you ever been swimming and you, oh, I'm in the deep water, oh, oh, and your feet hit solid bottom in the pool, especially if you don't swim very well. So whew, my nose is still above the water. It means solid footing. It's used that way in one of the Psalms. You're standing on a secure place. It's security. Paul will use this when he talks about, remember when he says, now I'm out of my mind to talk about this, but I'm absolutely convinced that it's the word of being convinced, absolutely sure. In fact, it's taken that sense when you come to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the evidence of things unseen, the assurance of God's purposes for us through faith. Assurance. The word that we're looking at here in the original means that the Son is exactly the same, although distinct, from what makes God to be solidly God. What God is in His own resolve. What God is on the inside out in His person. In fact, did you know Psalm 139, that great pro-life uh, psalm, which says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You've known my inward parts. I think the King James says, I was curiously wrought in my mother's womb, or wondrously made. Did you know that's the word here, it's the same word? That what you really are on the inside, all of your organs and your nature, your DNA code, that's the same word. Hupostasios, you're in your being. Okay, now we're trying to learn the word. Now let's try to put it together. I'm turning you into theologians. If you did your jumping jacks, you'd be ready for this now, okay? He is exactly the glory of God in his being. And he is the exact copy, not the same, exact copy of whatever is God on his inside. The full resolve of God, the full assurance of God, the full steadiness of God, the full character of God, the full person of God, whatever God is, that's what Christ is too. He's inseparable in His deity. You put this together, you say, like Father, like Son. Some of you may have learned the catechism question, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We can say, if this is true, Christ is the same as the Father. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. This is the Trinity. Now, what's my point? Is Jesus worth it? Don't you understand? He is God. He is God. Is there anybody else that you know of that's God? Everybody else is just but a mere mortal, a creature, a vapor that will pass away. And you're letting them change your commitment to Christ? He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's your creator. He's the end of your history. He is one with God, distinct from God in the triunity of the great God of the universe. He is your God. He is worth everything. When those people try to convince you to reject Christ, remember, they're nothing but a vapor. They will one day disappear, and the place will know them no more. Well, as we conclude, there's so much more we could say, but I want you to get this. Where's the gospel? Have we gotten to it yet? We've gone through the whole history of Revelation. We've gone through the very nature of God. And notice what happens. It says, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He says that we can't talk about the gospel, yet we're still talking about who Jesus is. He is the providential source. If you were with the Sunday school class this morning, we had the idea that all things hold together in him. The strong force in the atom in Colossians 1. Here it says, all things here, if you look at, are upheld. 
He is the one that keeps the order. He's the one that sustains them from disappearing. Jesus is not only the creator, he's the providential force of everything. The triune God, second person is at work. And only after you get through the history, the nature of God, the work of providence, finally you come to this. After making purification for sins. The writer of the Hebrews says you cannot talk about the Savior unless you know who he is. You must know his person to understand his work. It is the one who purifies sin. And notice it's accomplished. He has made that. It is finished. And unlike any other priest who ever lived, he's finished his work so much that he can sit down. Doesn't have to keep on offering sacrifice. Isn't it great to sit down after a busy day so my work is done? He sat down. But we know it even further. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is in the very presence of Almighty God. And therefore, as the heir, he has a name that's greater. Once the angels ministered to him in his incarnation, but now he's been elevated to glory. He's above everything. There's a conclusion that I hope you cannot escape. If today, if you are waffling in your faith because of people or culture or books you're reading, ask yourself, are they God? Is this writer the beginning and end and the heart of history? Is this opponent the one who created me? Is this one one with God and distinct from God? Is this the one who is upholding the very molecules of all the universe and keeping in place? Is this the one who can take away my sin and make me right with God? Is this the one who can whisper in God's ear and say, forgive that one, Father, bless him, make intercession for us? Of course not. This book was written so that those suffering Hebrew Christians would have steel in their backbone. And that's what we need today. Let no one move you. Let no one shake your faith. Read again Hebrews chapter 1. You're dealing with God, the God-man. But then when you hear an evangelical say, well, I really love the cross. I'm not so sure about who Jesus is. Take him back to Hebrews 1 and say, do you know who he is? Do you know why his blood is so valuable? Do you know why his cross works so well? Do you know why it's worthy of risking everything to share it with the world? Because he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. But he came to be crucified under Pontius Pilate for my sins. Do you know that, Savior? Let good and kindreds go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. But God's word abideth still. Lord, would you please bless us now as we leave. We've had the privilege to wrestle with great mysteries, but they are truths that you've given to the church right here in the scriptures. May they be true in our heart and may we be strong in your word for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise for our concluding hymn. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.